Many neuroscientists and philosophers argue that there is no such thing as free will. Some even claim experiment has proven this to be the case. Yet the behavior of these same scientists and philosophers appear to assume their own freedom, say, when formulating and promoting their own theory. To avoid this paradox, should we accept that free will is an illusion and as a consequence cease to praise our children when they do well and refrain from punishing murderers when they are caught? Or is the denial of free will a mistake driven by the desire to avoid a profound conflict with the scientific assumption that its laws alone govern the universe? Let's meet our three speakers. Helen Stewart, professor of philosophy of mind and action at the University of Leeds, is known for her work on the metaphysics of mind and free will, including her influential 2012 book, A Metaphysics for Freedom. Patrick Haggard is the professor of cognitive neuroscience at University College London. He's a leading researcher in neuroscientific research into free will, having held positions at Yale and Oxford University and won the Jean Nico Prize for Philosophy of Mind. Dan Dennett is perhaps one of the most famous and controversial figures in philosophy today. His groundbreaking work includes the books Darwin's Dangerous Idea and Consciousness Explained, and he spent much of his time arguing tirelessly for an atheistic and naturalistic view of the world. We're gonna start with a three minute introduction uh, by each of the speakers. Let's start with Helen. Is the denial of free will a mistake? Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, so what I would want to say to begin with is that the answer to the question whether the denial of free will is a mistake is, is the boring philosopher's one that it does depend what you mean by free will. I say that not just because I'm a philosopher, but because it is the right answer. Um, I think there are some conceptions of free will that are what I think of as sort of mad conceptions. A uh, mad conception of free will, for example, would be the idea that you sort of have to make yourself um, from the ground up, from scratch, by choosing all your desires and your values and your principles sort of out of nowhere. Um, I mean, that's obviously a conception of free will that, that no one could satisfy. In fact, it leads to a, an infinite regress because it makes no sense to choose things like desires and values and principles, except by reference to some further desires, values and principles. And so you could re-raise the question and so on and so on. Uh, so not even God could have free will on that conception of free will. Um, so... That's the first thing I want to say. There are mad conceptions. I don't want to be defending any of those. The question then remains, are there any conceptions of free will which, which are worth defending um, but, uh, that aren't mad in, in that sense? And I think the answer to that is yes. And that's what I'm going to be trying to argue this evening. The conception that I want to defend is a conception which is opposed to what I think of as a very bottom-up way of thinking about the human agent. What I mean by bottom-up, is an idea of the human agent where the agent's doings, his or her actions, are entirely determined uh, by the mechanistic interactions of, say, a chemical or electrical kind uh, of, of her small parts, you know, things like neurons, cells. Uh, we could go even lower, talk about molecules and so on. Um, that reductive conception of the human being is one I want to insist we have absolutely no reason from science or anywhere else to endorse, and that's going to be my position this evening. Patrick, your opening statement, is the denial of free will a mistake? I think uh, from a scientific point of view, you might want to start with the phenomena. And for me, the phenomena that need to be explained are actions. So people make actions. I think we generally would agree with that. And these would be things like pressing a button or signing your name or even pulling a trigger. But the question then is where do those actions come from? And my approach, coming both from neuroscience and from psychology is what you might call reverse engineering of actions. So an action is the contraction of a muscle. Why does the muscle contract? It contracts because particular neurons in a brain area called the primary motor cortex fire. And then why do those neurons fire? Well, they fire because neurons in some brain areas just anterior, more frontally, to the primary motor cortex, they fire. And you can keep looking back and saying, well, what, what's the causal chain here? But what you don't ever find is anything mystical or anything exceptional. And what's quite interesting, in fact, is that modern neuroscience doesn't now view the brain as a, a linear causal chain going back to some uh, imagined first cause, which uh, you, know, you might think of as free will. Rather, the brain works as a loop. 
So the real cause of the action that I make now is the combination of two driving forces. One is the brain's representation of the wide context in which I am. So the brain, human brain in particular, is able to integrate an enormous amount of information and bring it all to bear on uh, the action that I make now. So this perhaps explains the appearance of complexity behind human action. And the second really striking feature about human action is that the action that I make now depends on what you might call history, but I think I would prefer to call memory, the previous experience that I've had of making actions in the past. So there are lots of actions that I know are really appropriate in one context because I've learned that, but are really not appropriate in another context because I've learned that too. So I think what this means is that all of these events which lead to the astonishing behavioral repertoire that humans can perform, and we, the, the range of things that I can do or that you can do at any one time is staggeringly wide compared to most other animals. But it's all still due to brain activity. And as far as we know, all of that brain activity amounts to chemical and electrical events which obey the laws of physics, which obey natural laws. So there's nothing, there's nothing exceptional, there's nothing, as it were, strange. And in that sense, I think I would definitely like to agree with Helen that we can, we can reject exceptionalist ideas of free will. Instead, I think what we need to do is to account for the, the range and diversity of human action. But we can do that within completely mechanistic conceptions of brain science. Dan, your opening statement, is the denial of free will a mistake? Uh, yes, it is. Uh, but I think actually I agree with just about everything that both Patrick and Helen said. Um, the big mistake comes when people confuse control with causation. Yes, everything that happens, everything you do is caused. Uh, uh, determinism is just not the issue. Uh, let's, for the, as it were, to worst case scenario, it, let's suppose that the world really is deterministic. Um, well, then we can't flip coins, can we? Oh, yes, of course we can. And aren't coin flips caused? Yes, they are, like everything else. But they aren't controlled. The thing that coin flips have been designed to be an action with readily observable uh, uh, results, which can make a huge difference to how things go, but they can't be controlled. That's, that's the point of a coin flip. And the same thing is true, interestingly enough, of our brains. Um, uh, people like Patrick do wonderful experiments, but in order to do an experiment, you have to clamp uncounted millions of degrees of freedom to get the subject to do just one of two things, then if you establish that sort of control, if you impose that very narrow channel on that brain, then indeed you can sometimes predict up to you know, 10 seconds ahead of time uh, which choice the person will make. Uh, that's interesting, but it doesn't shed any light on the reality of the kind of free will it's worth defending, as Helen says, or worth wanting, as I've said. The kind of free will it's worth wanting is the kind that normal human adults have when they're not being manipulated. And there, there's a real threat facing us right now. Uh, our autonomy has been uh, outstanding up to now, but new techniques, not so much of, of tampering with people's brains, but tampering with their minds, which are their brains, but tampering with them by misinformation and, and uh, uh, subtle disinformation, which tends to turn us into puppets, uh, where we think we have more control than we do. That is the danger. It's a real danger. But what we have to learn is not that we might as well give up because we don't have free will. What we have to learn is, how can I protect the autonomy that I have from those agents, and it's all those agents, who want to control me. The weather doesn't want to control me. Gravity doesn't want to control me. They're not agents. Agents are the sources. Agents are controllers. And a, 
autonomous agent is a self-controlled agent. All right. So we seem to have a, a lot of prima facie agreement here. Let's see if we can drill in a little, little more and, and uncover some areas of disagreement. Let's start by talking about the implications of science on this old philosophical question. So we've talked about uh, causality being built right into the methodology, into the, the theory and practice of science. Um, that has long been taken as a threat to the idea of libertarian free will. On top of that, experiments have shown, the Libet experiments for one, that our actions are decided by our brains before we have the conscious experience of deciding to take these actions. So does science, for either of these reasons, tell us that free will is impossible? Can we start with Patrick? To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.